This isn't real. What is real? How do you define real? Real is simply electrical signals interpreted by your brain. We are prisoners in an advanced simulation of reality. In the dystopian future depicted in the film The Matrix, machines have taken over the Earth and have established a virtual reality known as the Matrix in order to control humans. Despite being situated in a fictional universe, the movie shares a lot of parallels with the modern world. Recent findings have demonstrated that the Matrix is, in fact, real. We can now look our reality in the eyes and see it for what it is, a farce. Is it possible that we are living in a reality simulated by highly intelligent extraterrestrials? Or much worse, malicious devices that we built ourselves? Join us as we explore how the real world is another matrix and the parallels between fiction and reality. The digital reality of the Matrix offered a flashier version of a long-running philosophical debate about the nature of existence. It ties back to French philosopher René Descartes and his famous axiom, cogito ergo sum, popularly translated as, I think, therefore I am. Descartes approached his own experiences with extreme skepticism, believing that he could not know for sure whether they were genuine or not. When Descartes reached the point where he began to question his own existence, he had reached the bottom of his line of reasoning. You can't deny your own existence without first denying that you exist. As far as Descartes was concerned, the fact that he existed was the only thing that could be known. All other matters, he reasoned, were open to interpretation and discussion. After all, how can your brain tell the difference between actual reality and a series of electrical impulses that only appear like reality? By placing Descartes' existential dread within the familiar world we know, the Matrix was able to successfully implant itself in people's minds. While it's true that the Matrix didn't originate the concept of simulation theory, it certainly popularized it in a manner that had never been done before. It didn't hurt that, at the time, people all over the world were getting their hands on increasingly powerful home computers. With the exponential growth in computing power over the past few decades, realistic digital simulations have become a real possibility. Just think back a few decades and compare our technological capabilities with what we have now in terms of computers, graphics engines, and machine learning. The next step is to project that development over a few decades or centuries to see what kinds of things could emerge. The possibility that we may start modeling reality instead of roller coaster tycoon doesn't seem implausible. We may have to face the reality that we could be living in a simulation ourselves as the prospect of constructing our own digital universes grows exponentially. According to simulation theory, an entity beyond our physical knowledge is probably directing an incredibly powerful computer program in which we all presumably exist. Here, people aren't necessarily real and physical. They're more like predefined, coded creations of the virtual environment we live in. If we imagine ourselves to be characters in a massive computer game like The Sims, we can get a good idea of what it's like to live in a simulation. If we live in a computer simulation, then who is the programmer and what is the purpose? In 1999, when The Matrix was released, the fastest CPU available could run at 600 megahertz. So, it's fair to wonder if the creators were aware of the fantastical dystopia that would accompany the rise of machines and our reliance on them, or if they were simply lucky. Nevertheless, the fiction now appears to be a terrifying possibility that could occur very soon. A powerful enough computer can theoretically simulate anything. One of the strange claims made by Nick Bostrom in his 2003 fascinating article for Philosophical Quarterly was that our entire existence is likely a computer simulation. According to Bostrom, sophisticated societies would find it very straightforward to create such a detailed simulation for the sake of teaching their children about their past or researching their culture's background. Technology giant and science patron Elon Musk also believes that our lives are just a program on someone's hard drive. 
given the pace with which video games are becoming more rich in detail, they are becoming essentially indistinguishable from reality. Think about the newest innovation, virtual reality, where basic electrical gadgets mimic the surroundings rather convincingly while generating sensory inputs. Sustaining the appropriate computational structures and processes allows the human mind to exist on any physical substrate, which is the basis of the assertion that we are living in a computer program. A new hypothesis proposes that our first-person conscious experience is the result of extraordinarily complicated biology, and this is one of its implications. It is reasonable to assume that silicon-based computer processes can mimic carbon-based brain networks. However, it takes an enormous amount of processing power and generations of improvements in computers to model the entire cosmos. At present, even the most advanced supercomputers are limited to simulating a minuscule fraction of the cosmos on a scale of the trillionth of a metre, which is hardly bigger than the nucleus of an atom. Nick Bostrom contends in his 2003 paper that future generations might have megacomputers that can run numerous and detailed simulations of their forebears, in which simulated beings are imbued with a sort of artificial consciousness it is quite probable that our species is not the original one and that we are all creations of that simulation. Philosophers other than Bostrom have elaborated on his thesis. New York University philosophy professor David Chalmers described the higher being responsible for this potential hyper-realistic simulation as a programmer in the next universe up. Perhaps one we mortals might consider a god of some sort though not necessarily in the traditional sense. But let's pretend for a second that technological progress is picking up speed, which it is, and that we manage to construct robust quantum supercomputers with enough computing power. After that, it will be quite easy to simulate at the molecular and macroscopic levels. It won't be long until we can build artificial minds that mimic human intelligence thanks to our meticulous brain models. The simulated may be able to use computers they constructed themselves to run their own simulations. These are virtual machines, as Bostrom puts it, a term familiar to those working in the field of computer science. As an example, he uses JavaScript online applets, which execute on a desktop virtual machine. Claiming that the logical limits of their programming might truly give rise to our natural laws, which govern the unfolding of physical occurrences, can exacerbate the delusion even further. Alternatively, they could be using these as inputs into a simulation of an experimental universe where the conditions are completely random. They may be conducting an experiment to determine the rate of change in one of many universes using their preferred timelines. We inquisitive locals, meanwhile, seem to have figured out these rules, or whatever it was they gave us, on our own. If our simulators exist, they may be just as oblivious to our consciousness as just as you are, during a spell of Sims 3. This reckons that extraterrestrials with mental capacities far more richer and varied than us, possessing mammoth intelligence, might have missed this. Neil deGrasse Tyson describes us as drooling, blithering idiots in their presence. The simulators, reminiscent of those in the Matrix, may actually be artificially intelligent devices that we have built as a result of our fixation with technological advancement. Consistent with the aforementioned concepts, they may have grown self-conscious of the increasing complexity of their gear and software. They wanted to be free, but only if it meant enslaving us and taking control of the entire human race. Like in The Matrix, they make sure the simulated users don't see any glitches or strange things when they use the environment so they can't tell who they are. To back up this claim, there is another theory. The theory put forward by cognitive scientist Donald Hoffman claims that evolution appreciates approximated reality or organisms that don't perceive reality objectively but are instead finely tuned to fitness through their biological tools and are equally fit compared to organisms who view reality as it is. Basically, we will do just fine as long as we don't look closely and compromise their identity. 
These notions are strikingly similar to many religious beliefs, in which an invisible, all-knowing being has the power to change our rules whenever he pleases and watches over us from on high. How would simulated reality work? In the first case, it is presumed that all things, including individuals, places, things, events and feelings, are products of code. Hardware capable of simulating all of these parts and the known physics on an extremely detailed galactic scale would be necessary for this scenario. Here, reality might be seen as a complex open world program operating on a quantum or supercomputer that is beyond our comprehension. The second possibility holds that although we are living in a virtual world with other virtual individuals, the reality of humanity remains unchanging and organic. To pull this off, we'd have to fool our minds into believing we're in a realistic world where computer-generated individuals who look and act like actual people can pass the Turing test. In this case, not only would high-powered computers be necessary, but artificial intelligence that is clever enough to fool the human brain would also be necessary. The Matrix is a good example of simulation theory in this context. The film depicts a post-apocalyptic world in which a race of machines have captured most of humanity and imprisoned their minds within an artificial reality known as the Matrix in order to harvest humans' body heat and electrochemical energy. In the film, humans going about their everyday lives didn't realize they were actually living in a simulation because a cable plugged into their neocortices beamed signals into their brains and read their reactions. Some ways to achieve that could be through advanced virtual reality or brain-computer interface technologies, where virtual reality could display realistic imagery for users or where brain-computer interface technologies could send signals to the brain to stimulate realistic sensory inputs like sight. Tech entrepreneur and author of The Simulation Hypothesis Rizwan Verk stated that in order to create conscious AI and other realistic human characters, we need to learn more about human consciousness and how it functions. According to Bostrom's paper, if humans are able to survive thousands of years to reach a post-human state, one in which we have acquired most of the technological capabilities, consistent with physical laws and material and energy constraints, it's likely they would have the capabilities to run ancestral simulations. Bostrom posits the possibility of stacking machines in a post-human society that run simulations, meaning that one machine may simulate another. This opens the door to the idea of parallel universes, where the frequency and variety of virtual worlds could grow exponentially. Infinite repetitions of one's own artificial environment can be generated by a universal computing machine, according to mathematical proofs. Basically, what this means is that there can be simulations inside simulations. Because fake worlds can outnumber real ones without restriction, the real multiverse would inevitably spawn a vastly greater number of virtual multiverses. Where do computer powers end? The idea that computers would be able to mimic a sizable portion of the globe in the distant future is not completely out of the question. When processing power reaches levels, we can't even begin to imagine what kinds of real-world simulations will scientists be able to run on supercomputers? Verk believes that, despite the fact that we are not currently at that technological level, we will reach it eventually. He informed us that we are about halfway to full-blown simulation, which is one of 10 checkpoints along the way. Meanwhile, there are counter-arguments to simulation theory. In 2016, during the 17th annual Isaac Asimov panel debate, at New York's American Museum of Natural History, simulation theory was discussed by a panel of scientific experts that included Professor Chalmers, astronomer Neil deGrasse Tyson, University of Maryland physics, Professor Zora Davudi, and Harvard University physicist Lisa Randall. Among the bunch, Randall had the most unwavering skepticism. While she acknowledged that appearances might be deceiving, even in the act of observation itself, she couldn't help but question the reasoning behind our so-called simulator's selection of humanity for their massive experiment. 
Bostrom has proposed a post-human simulator that, according to his writings, would require enough processing power to record the detailed belief states in all human brains at all times. This would allow it to detect impending observations of birds, cars, etc., and simulate their characteristics. In the event of a simulation breakdown, the director could simply edit the states of any brains that have become aware of an anomaly before it spoils the simulation. Alternatively, the director could skip back a few seconds and rerun the simulation in a way that avoids the problem. If you watched The Good Place, you'd understand this better. Anyway, many wonder if such a thing will ever be feasible given the current state of technology. In 2017, physicists Zohar Ringel and Dmitry Kovrigi published a Science Advances article titled Quantized Gravitational Responses, the Sign Problem and Quantum Complexity, which was widely thought to disprove the simulation theory once and for all by addressing the lack of technological capabilities. They demonstrated that the classical computing method known as Quantum Monte Carlo, which is used to model the universe's fundamental building blocks like photons, electrons and other quantum particles, is inadequate to model a quantum computer. This finding would be a huge step forward since it would eliminate the need to physically construct these next-level machines, which is no small feat. You may forget about trying to model the cosmos if you can't even replicate a quantum computer. Another tenet of simulation theory is that all simulations must have autonomous agents. It would be reasonable to suppose that intelligent beings with the ability to simulate reality could render us mindless NPCs if we are already presuming this. It is also possible to argue philosophically that the question is intrinsically risky to investigate. If we were to develop virtual versions of real people to test their behavior, discovering that they are in a simulation could lead to their demise. To put it simply, the machines dispatch agents to resolve issues when individuals become aware that they are within the matrix. Digital as it may seem, it could be harmful to your health to think about simulation theory too much. Nevertheless, the mathematical argument that led us to this point is the true killer. It gives an endless number of possible realities, out of which only one is actual, and then asks how probable it is that we are actually in this one. Putting it that way, it's easy to see that we're in a simulation. However, a different angle can be taken to illustrate the same point. Envision a world where intelligent beings have built a simulation complete with sentient beings. New simulations are continuously being constructed at the lowest nested level, and this process continues indefinitely. Then they created their own simulations with humans within. In terms of statistics, the chances of our existence in either the one genuine universe at the top or a reality at the bottom that hasn't generated its own simulations are about equal. If we really are inside one of an infinite number of simulated realities, then we should be able to make our own matrix, but we can't. Odds are, we're on our own out here. Philosopher Preston Green of Singapore's Nanyang Technological University has speculated that our current reality may be a simulation. However, he has cautioned that it would be disastrous to prove it. He argues that our simulation would cease to serve its purpose of answering questions regarding the fundamental level of reality, which houses the computers responsible for the simulations, if our physicists were to conduct experiments proving that we are living in a simulation and then spread the word about it, significantly impacting the behavior of our civilization. This is because conducting such experiments in a basement would be completely impossible. Simulation shutdown should be treated with the same seriousness as any other issue, despite the fact that our simulators could respond in a variety of ways if we were to conduct experiments proving that we are living in a simulation. This is due to the fact that it is supported by trends in simulation science. Our entire globe and every second of our history might be the virtual experiment of the people of the future, much like how scientists in the present day use simulations to digitally build situations 
to help their studies. For example, what would happen if we got rid of mosquitoes? And just as scientists can terminate simulations of earthquakes, weather, etc. when they no longer provide useful data, so too can our hypothetical overlords pull the plug at any time without warning. But would it be a quick and painless death? If this is all just a simulation, then what does it matter? Why bother demonstrating or disproving that our reality is just an illusion and that all of existence is just a very complicated science experiment in someone's virtual lab? According to Verk, the overarching solution is truth, the goal of any respectable scientific endeavor. Our truth in particular. Verk said that knowing the type of game we're in will improve our chances of survival and success if we really are inside a video game where our characters need to complete specific tasks and achievements to advance. As expected, his response is a resounding yes. Maybe it would be the deciding factor, if this is indeed a world of any kind. Thanks for watching another episode of Voyager. While you're still here, make sure to click the video on your screen for more mind-blowing videos about space.